Thanks for staying with us. Now, generational wealth is wealth that is passed down from one generation to another. Um, this is through the accumulation of assets for the future to provide financial security. Once a family has significant wealth, the problem becomes how to preserve it for the future generation, a surprisingly difficult task. Effective multi-generational wealth management requires a family to tackle the personal issues that determines who should benefit from the wealth. The tax hurdles and the, uh, that stand in the, in the way of its uh, efficient transfer and the capital market uncertainty that makes it challenging to invest um, in it prudently. Now, Olufemi Akonde is a lawyer with 38 years of experience. He runs a law firm, Odyssey Capital Partners, which focuses on family governance documentation. He is a bro um, the board chair at the MIC or Mishfaka Foundation. <laughs> he would help me with that pronunciation. We provide training, ad advice, and support for families wishing to create multi generational wealth. Um, and he is an author of the Family Wealth Book Listening to Trees. That's the title of the book. Now remember, you can join this conversation, tweet at us at Plus TV Africa or at Way Show Africa One with the hashtag Ways, or you send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 081-803-84663. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, Femi. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Can you pronounce that foundation again? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it's called Mish Mishpaha. Oh, it's my a Hebrew goodness. word. So where is it, it's a where is it from? It's a Hebrew word. It just means Oh, family. Hebrew. Wow, Mishapa. Sounds like right. <laughs> All right, so um, it's so lovely to have you here this evening. It's lovely to be here. So you know what? Um, maybe we should start from what has been happening around us in Nigeria or globally. There has been a lot of um, death, death. You hear um, older people dying and all of that. And somehow, somehow, it seems in Nigeria, it is prominent people that we hear that are passing. You know, and we know that there's a culture here when it comes to managing family assets and all of that. It's always almost seeming like it's a problem. At the end of the day, I, I know some families that have been in court for ages. They've not been able to resolve the issue. So do we even have the spirit to be able to build um, multi-generational businesses here in Nigeria? I think, um, thank you so much. That's a great question. I think um, the problem isn't actually Nigeria. It's just a global problem. Um, the statistics globally are that only 1% of families take their wealth beyond the fourth generation. Hmm. Um, it's, it's, it's a huge issue. And if you look at um, a lot of our prominent families here, you look at the stage that they're in, and you look at the complexities that have already started building around them, and you project that to the next generation, you can actually see that those statistics are coming true. So irrespective of the amount of wealth that a family bequeaths to its children, the statistics are really damning. They're really difficult, just 1%. And the reason for that, which I think you've alluded to in, in your question, is that the problem of wealth is not about the money. It's about behavior. Hmm. It's about behavior. It's just about behavior. The statistics tell us that 85% of wealth failure is down to communications, breakdown in trust, um, feuds, family feuds, and lack of preparation of hairs. Hmm. 85%. It's not about the stock market. It's not about the price of gold. It's not about the price of property. It's just down to behavior. And so that that so that's a huge challenge. Um, um, and if you want, I can tell you why it is so. so please um, but tell that's us a why. Huge, <laughs> it's a huge challenge. Okay, so basically the way generations work is that the first generation creates the wealth. They wake up early in the morning. I'm sure you've heard people, stories like this from your parents. Yeah, early true. in the morning, we're not like the Nambi Pambi children nowadays. We even go to the stream to fetch water. Then we iron our school, our uniform with um, coal iron. Then we walked, you know, 20 kilometers. Mm -hmm. We had it tough. We struggled. And these people built their businesses through hard work. <laughs> the challenge was that because they were focused on building those businesses, they didn't have a lot of time mm. to mentor their children. Wow. Secondly, they were extremely strict on their children. You know, 
the generation that you know gets that slap at the back, the one they call about I just come who <laughs> or the sudden backhand, you know, where they're very strict. And this generation created this world, very strict, very time poor. By the time their children took over, the children did not have the sense of init initiative to build that world further. Their concern was that is wealth will not spoil on my watch. Hmm. So they held it and they were like, you know, daddy was a giant and I'm living in the shadow of the immortals. You know, I just don't know what to do. So they basically a stewarding generation. Hmm. However, however, when they have their own children, they say to themselves, my children will not suffer the wounds. Hmm. And so they indulge their children and they live their lives out to the third generation. That generation goes into what you call entropic expenditure. It spends, it pays the social tax, wherever country it is, it pays the social tax. Remember, by the time the third generation comes, the numbers have started increasing. The family is dispersed, I mean, Japan, so in China, and so on. Interests have grown apart. They're no longer in a common life cycle. Some are teachers, some are politicians, some are business people. They're speaking a totally different language. By the time they have their children, the world has significantly diminished to the exactly. extent that all you can do is to divide it. There's no compounding factor anymore. There's nothing increasing it anymore. Um, that's basically how it happens. Huh. Wow. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> Based on all these that you've said to us, it, it, I get to understand the fact that um, multi-generational wealth comes from behavior and um, it's a global thing. So I want you to tell me this. In your experience of creating multi-generational wealth for your clients, is there a clear-cut rule to building generational wealth and sustaining mm. it? Yes, there is. And the first thing is to understand that, you know, it's difficult, particularly in Nigeria, because money is important in Nigeria. You literally need to carry it around in your boots because of all the things. But the first thing that you need to do is something that's counterintuitive. And that is to realize that your wealth isn't actually money at all. The wealth is concerned with four types of capital. Health capital, intellectual capital, values capital, and financial capital. So first you have to stay alive. And what most of my clients do is that some of them are moving from healthcare or concierge typed healthcare, where you have the planes that take you out and everything. And they're moving now to predictive healthcare, mm. where they have doctors that are actually taking care of what we call the gene gene management, identifying the likely diseases in the future and addressing them today. So healthcare is a big issue. People have to stay alive. If, if they stay alive long enough, they'll be able to pass wisdom to the next generation. If they are caught off in their prime, that creates a mismatch between the past and the present. So health is a big issue. It's capital. You have to invest in it. Big time. The second is intellectual. Children and the family need to be extremely wise and extremely experienced. Mm. They need to know how to use the latest tools. They need to understand the way global economies work. They need to be well educated. So intellectual capital is another big form of investment. These are all investment heads that you, would, you see on the, on the sheet. And then you have values capital. Values capital for me is the biggest. Values capital is essentially the way you distill the family story. Who are we as a family? Hmm. Where did we come from? How did we make our money? What, are, what is the, our lifestyle? What are the things we're going to do? What are the things that we do not do? Those stories, you know, the kind of stories we used to tell way back when I, I, I was a 60s child, the kind of stories you used to tell when Nempa takes light or ECMN takes light maybe once every month is to gather and tell stories. So those stories actually help the family to, to stay on the line. Mm. They make sure that you don't go and lose your money to NNM or something like that. You know, you stay, you, 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 have, you chart a very clear course. So I've mentioned human capital, intellectual capital, values capital. Then of course there's money. Mm. But the role of money is to invest in the family. 
not to, not, not to stand on its own as a measure. Because yeah. if you look at it this way, if you have a child and that child invents the next Facebook or the next Instagram, think about the multiplier on the family wealth. It's huge. It's exponential. Exactly. We're not just getting 5% return. We're not just getting 7% on bonds with inflation at 12.5. With the climate we are in Nigeria now, everybody's taking a cold bath. There's no way. If inflation is at 12.5 and you're earning anything less than 12.5, you're, you're losing money. So, But if you are able to skillfully manage what we call your core capital, mm -hmm. that is the capital that you don't touch, that allows you to live off the interest, and then investing that interest and maybe a little bit of the capital in human capital, intellectual and values capital, you start to build the, the um, structure for wealth. Wow. Uti, so, <laughs> are you hearing what I'm hearing? That's <laughs> mind-blowing. I am. I am. And I mean, I like the family uh, element or family aspect of everything that you've said so far. What I would like to just um, step a little bit, step back from that just a little bit and look at the companies themselves. Now, I know you said that it's a global issue, so the issue of family businesses is not typically Nigerian, but I think that if we look at the, the data, we find that the issue is more prevalent in Nigerian families. Yes. So I'm an 80s child, and when I look back to a lot of the companies that were around in the 80s, so few of them are still around today. And then when I look at the top companies today, I ask myself, Will these companies be around in another 30 years or 40 years? And that's the concern um, for me. So my question is, how have companies like Walmart, like L'Oreal, mm. household names, Estee Lauder, that still have their children, you know, on the board or, or participating in the running of these companies, how have they managed to sustain? What is that gap that these Nigerian companies are missing? When, when I think to, I mean, if you're an 80s child, Oki Biscuit was part of your yeah. life. Ah. There was no way you could have grown up without that shortcake biscuit and the round biscuit. But today, that biscuit is nowhere to be found. I mean, um, I, I think he was a chief chief at Desoye. Um, that was the pride of Quara State, and then that company today is gone. So where's that disconnect coming from? Right. I think that's a good question that you say. I mean, the, the effect is fun. I mean, I, you could have a literal um, cemetery of businesses and families in the context. Um, I mean, just to add point to what you said, there's actually a company called Kongi Gumi in Japan that has been around from 578 AD. It's 1,442 years old. Wow. And it's now in its 46th generation. Mm -hmm. So people have been able to beat these odds. I think one of the things that has really affected us, obviously, we've had the complexities of, our, of polygamy in itself that has created certain dysfunctions mm. way back. But I think that the biggest problem is governance in terms of the fact that apart from the culture, you've got to have a, ma a method of succession that is very clear that is very precise. And, and that is what we lack. A lot of our um, succession is based on um, culture, the first child, mm. you know, the male Not first child. Not necessarily whether the first child can do the job. Capable or not. Yeah. Maybe he doesn't even want to. Maybe he wants to play music. So it's about governance, um, identifying the hair, setting the right standards for admitting people to the business. The business, for instance, should not be a parking lot for the problem children, the children that cannot succeed outside. So let's put him inside somewhere. Let's find something. This is not. This is the problem we have. Um, and we, unless we have good governance, a merit-driven system, very clear succession policies, we're going to have a problem of managing transitions. Mm -hmm. Because when you want to win a race, the key is in the handover of the beta. It's not really how fast you run. But can you hand over that baton in a seamless manner? And I think that that's where we struggle. A lot of our um, people that have come before us have struggled with the concept of mortality. We don't like to believe that we die. We sometimes believe that the moment we start writing something down, that is a voice speaking in our head that we're going to die next mm. So governance, planning succession, managing transition um, triggers, and going for merit over culture, I think is... 
Okay, I think I'm losing you a bit in and out. But, you know, oh. um, <laughs> the network is it's a bit shaky. Yes, it is. <laughs> All right, so you... <laughs> but, you know, um, because we have a few minutes to run off before we, we go on a break, what Uti is saying, because I just wanted to give a scenario. In, um, in Kaduna State, for instance, there was an airline. I wouldn't mention the airline's name. They, they were running so well. I am sure that if that airline had continued you know, till today, it would have been one of the, I, I'm sure maybe it would have been converted to a national carrier or something. But you know this polygamy, because you mentioned polygamy. You know, you mentioned polygamy. But polygamy thing, okay, he has many wives and he now became, okay, this wife, this, this, he started donating each, probably each plane to each of the wives Finally. and all of that. And the business completely went on the ground. You know, so if we want to, if, if we want to, um, what's it called, go by that ana analysis, analysis, right? Was it you that asked the question? Mm -hmm. If a family is running the business like a family, right? Mm -hmm. Or if, 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 it, if it is a family business, yes, but it is more of a structure where they, they, they bring a third party an CEO. An outsider coming in. A, yes, exactly. a, a third party, a, an outsider coming mm -hmm. to run the company. Do you think it stands the better chance of moving to different generations. I'm yet to ask that question. Oh, you are yet to ask? Because I thought you had asked. <laughs> no, he can go ahead. Because he mentioned polygamy. Exactly. I think that outside managers are a good idea. Hmm. Um, but if you have a very strong family culture that's positive, you have to be sure that there is a match between the external professional you're bringing in and your family culture. So, for instance, the... Um, let's say a family like the, um, uh, let's see, let's, let's say, let's say a family like the Gabolettos, who have a very distinct Italian family, or the Berettas, they have a culture. You have to make sure that there's a match between. Okay, so Femi, um, uh, if you can yes. hear me, sorry, let me just interrupt you. Let's go for a quick break, then you'd answer that question, because it seems to be a long one. <laughs> okay. All right.